Okay, so hello and welcome, or welcome back. Um, my name is Tom Price. I am one of the co-curators of This Land, American Engagement with the Natural World, and I have the pleasure of introducing our final panel of the day, Redefining American Art Across Boundaries, a conversation that has extended into the first two um, panels of the day, which seems very natural and appropriate. I want to start with the main title of the exhibition, This Land. Um, it's a simple two-word phrase, a demonstrative pronoun followed by a noun. Um, but for all of its unambiguous intent, the phrase's meaning is surprisingly open to interpretation. Even when taken fairly literally, referring to this land that we are gathered upon here today, the meaning and identity of this place is complicated. Um, it is land owned by Dartmouth College. It is in the state of New Hampshire in the northeastern United States. It is nestled in the northeastern portion of the Appalachian Mountains, and it is also part of the unceded lands and waters of the Abenaki people. The meaning of this land, in other words, is dependent upon the speaker. It can mean different things to different people or multiple things to many. It is irreducible to a static, singular meaning. We use this phrase, and I believe I can speak for my fellow co-curators here, because it usefully disrupts part of the subtitle of the exhibition, the American in American Engagement with the Natural World. This land is a phrase that opens out to a variety of meanings, while American coalesces them into a singular identity. American has long been used as a shorthand for this very reason. It's quite useful to use one word rather than try to explain the cultural, political, and social boundaries of identity within the United States. But because of this very reason, because what it means to be American is by no means simple or obvious, we also must challenge our assumptions about we, what we mean by American art. This issue isn't restricted to the theoretical, um, as it directly influences the ways that we conduct academic discussions and curate exhibitions and have conversations as members of the broader public. Determining who and what objects should be included in an exhibition concerning American art was a continuous question during the planning process. What subject matter is deemed American? Do we enforce modern political borders on historic objects? And how do we tell a nuanced history while acknowledging the difficulty of truly equitable representation? The resulting exhibition, which we saw while subtitled American Engagement with the Natural World, is not entirely bound by nationality. Um, it opens one floor above us, for example, with a birch bark canoe made by the Canadian Abenaki artisan Louis Gill, whose work helps ground, up, ground us in a sense of place, um, one that is defined by the waterways of the Northeast rather than its political borders. On the second floor, John James Audubon and James Bowen illustrate some of the animal species that are found in North America, defining, defining America in terms of its unique fauna. Across the gallery, artists of Dominican descent from the collective Dominican New York Proyecto Grafica create visions of New York City which equally figure New York and the Dominican Republic as home. Together, these works of these, the work of these artists suggests that there is no singular definition of American art, and instead contend that it is always contingent and complex. And crucially, I think they raise the fact that, um, that the term American itself is not neutral. It has been applied to different political, cultural, and ethnic groups at different times in US history. Putting together this, this exhibition, we explored one possibility of how we might move forward with this unstable term. Each of our panelists joining us this afternoon, Kirsten Pye Buick, Teresa Montoya, and Alexander Thomas, have carefully explored these issues in their own written and curatorial work. Together, we're asking how we define and discuss American art. How do we teach and curate in ways that speak to the past, the present, and the future? And how, and how might interdisciplinary conversations meaningfully move these conversations forward? After their talks, a panel will be moderated, um, we'll be joined by the moderation by Hazel Carby, the Charles C. and Dorothy S. Dilley Professor Emeritus of, of African American Studies at Yale University, and Roth Distinguished Visiting Scholar here at Dartmouth College. And to start our conversation, I would like to in, uh, invite Kirsten to the podium.
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this has been a learning experience for me. It has been a pleasure. It's been an honor. I would like to start by thanking the Hood Museum for hosting, for Jamie uh, Powell for inviting me, and Michael Hartman. Um, I would like to thank John Stomberg, Sharon Reed, but especially Chris and Nick, who are literally making this day possible. <laughs> so I thought that for my talk that today, I would talk about art as absolution, art history as absolution, and redemptory installations in imperial museums. Three case studies and a coda we can go over tomorrow. <laughs> My context is that I am a former museum educator, a veteran of four years at the Art Institute of Chicago. It was no picnic. I am an African American woman who has had to fight to define her field as American art because I wrote my dissertation on a 19th century sculpture, sculptor who was Ojibwe and black. And I am a teacher in one form or another since 1995. Institutional critique is a necessary component of my teaching. And in 2009, I was charged with developing a class at the University of New Mexico on American landscapes. It was put on the books by the land and funded program, Land Arts of the American West, which has since shifted from a type of go west young man program to an art and ecology area and an environmental humanities institute. And yet it is a program that very few of our indigenous students from art studio participate in. I think that I know why they avoid it. In 2017, UNM held a conference, Decolonizing Nature, Resistance, Resilience, Revitalization. Billed as an interdisciplinary environmental justice public forum, the conference was built on the idea that, quote, the colonization of nature under capitalism is rooted in an ethos that views human beings as separate to and above nature earth masters for whom the planet is an inexhaustible reservoir of natural resources to be exploited. And it goes on, capital's colonization of nature has brought us to our current moment of grave ecological peril, climate change, sixth extinction, and other human caused environmental crises that cumulatively and rapidly degrade earth's life sustaining ecological fabric. And then they question, how do we resist further ecological devastation? How do we achieve resilience in times of stress? How do we revitalize affected ecological habitats and communities? End of questioning. Standing Rock was constantly invoked, but significantly there was no mention of Flint, Michigan, even by scholars who were from Michigan. Nicholas Mirzoff on the Anthropocene asks, what does it mean to say black lives matter in the context of the Anthropocene? As is now common knowledge, the Anthropocene is the proposed name for a new geological era, the recent human era. And he answers definitively, it's not the Anthropocene, it's the white supremacy scene, end of quote. How do we avert replicating the old ideologies as categories of practice in the hot new methodologies, takes, terminologies? We have yet to finish the work of landscape. We have yet to finish the work of landscape. For example, what does it mean to celebrate histories of conservation and what Carl Jacobi described as the era of extermination. Instead, we have rushed to deploy art and art history as absolving agents, dissolving and dissolving agents in our redemptory installations in imperial museums. 
Shane Thomas, writing for Media Diversified in 2015, argues, sometimes the choices made by an individual are symptoms of wider societal structures. And the attempt of any white person to conceal a horrific past uh, into how white people mediate with race. His essay, which was in response to Ben Affleck begging Henry Louis Gates Jr. to hide his family's history in the slave trade, is what Thomas is addressing here. And he says, asking, um, he says, asking white people to confront raci racism seems to always result in vigorous resistance. And he writes, an accusatory rejoinder to this assertion is that people of color are simply trying to make white people feel guilty. And pontificating about the past only prevents progress in the present. And this is very germane to today's uh, outlawing of critical race theory so far in eight states and spreading. Thomas continues, not only is such a mindset ahistorical, it avoids the crux of the problem. And he says, the problem isn't white guilt, it, it's white absolution. End of quote. And so I am addressing absolution on a systemic scale. Recently, I was asked a question about progress in race relations. After 51 years on the campus at UNM, Africana Studies transitioned from program to department, and I was named inaugural chair. And keep in mind, I'm 58. That program had been on that campus 51 years. This garnered quite a bit of attention locally and requests for interviews. During one, I was asked if I thought that there had been progress in race relations. And clearly, I was supposed to look at myself and say, yes, we've made it. Um, <laughs> I answered honestly that I don't think in terms of progress, that progress is an old, old Protestant ideology that signifies a spiritual and moral journey from damnation to salvation. And that journey is relational and could only be undertaken by white Protestants of European descent. Think John Bunyan's Pilgrim Pro Pilgrim's Progress from 1678. I said that instead, when I feel or perceive the least bit of a lessening of pressure I search to find what group has spilled the vacuum of exploitation. I then gave him the example of Chinese immigrants brought here to uh, build the transcontinental railroad and how the end of enslavement meant the rise of the, and the birth and the rise of the prison industrial complex. And so Chinese immigrants were out of work and they go to Canada to finish their transcontinental railroad. He responded, that's dark. <laughs> so I laughed and rolled my eyes and said, my students give me hope. Guess which statement he printed. It is my contention that we don't need to describe Thomas Cole as proto-environmentalist. It is an unnecessary designation that exposes the absolving perception of environmentalism and conservationism, both of which are ideologies that are not contradicted by the racism and nationalism, nationalism that subtends them. It was November 30th, 2021, after all, that Prince William found himself at the center of a controversy when he was speaking at the Tusk Conservation Award ceremony in London with an array of Africans behind him that he said that the increasing pressure on the African continent's wildlife and wild spaces are a result of human population. And that this human population was presenting a huge challenge for conservationists as it does the world over, end of quote. In other words, there are too many Africans in Africa. <laughs> and so when I think about New England and you know, I loved your presentation of the problem of that Boston gallery. 
Um, when I think about New England, when I think about the American South, I immediately think about them as empires. Historically, New England and the American South are treated as regions first within the British colonies and later the United States. In truth, they have always acted as empires, as large commercial organizations sustained and controlled by an elite, elite group of businessmen and plantation owners. And I know Dartmouth has done a lot of work recently on its slaveholding past. It's fascinating documentation on the internet. <clears throat> and so these, these empires have held sway over what was supposed to be a central governing authority, whether it was the British Crown or the US federal government. 19th century US landscape representation is irredeemable. Despite juxtapositions of contemporary indigenous art and 19th century landscapes and the hiring of indigenous curators, such juxtapositions, in fact, reinforce the hegemonic presence of such landscapes and make those who need the visual punishment feel better. It allows them to feel that they have done the work it is visual sentimentalism, it is visual empathy. The primacy and communicability of convention via conventional landscapes makes them more legible to audiences. We must denature so-called nature. This may mean expanding the space, one gallery that exposes the conventions of traditional landscape, what it hides, how it structures identities and identifications, the removal and mass slaughter of indigenous First Nations people, the exploitation of African labor, the exploitation and the removal of um, Mexican people from their land, and perhaps another gallery devoted to indigenous people's arts, but with caveats. We are bound and implicated by the questions we choose to ask. We are bound and we are implicated by the questions we choose to ask. One of my teaching and research interests is the material and visual culture of the first British Empire. I sometimes describe myself as a British diasporist. British encounters with various indigeneities Africa, India, Turtle Island. Um, I had to see this show, and so I told my sister, I really want to see this show. And so she bought us tickets. And in March, I got to see artists and empire facing Britain's imperial past. But think about how they've already framed the exhibition. Artist, empire, facing. Right? Facing implies confrontation or putting a face on empires others, telling us perhaps what was there before the British arrived. It did really kind of none of that. And the catalog cover is blurred on, pr on, uh, on purpose. I'm a veteran at PowerPoint. This is deliberate. <laughs> but it is a detail uh, of a work by Indian artist, that's how they label it, um, Delhi, Mahadaji Sindhiha entertaining a British naval officer and military officer with a notch, which is a, a dance performed by beautiful South Asian women. Right? And the date of this work is 1815 to 1820. And the description of the show, their intention, you see on the right. Instead, the show and the catalog centered British colonialism and British control and life under British rule. It was a show that centered empire. And I went back a second day because this is part of my training as a museum professional. You go and you look at the audience you see what's being programmed around the show because that tells you about curatorial intention. Okay. So I went back a second day just to experience and observe the visitors. What I saw was nostalgia, not confrontation. 
No photography was allowed, but I took this picture of the decolonial conga line. Um, <laughs> staged in one of the spaces that blended conventional representational art and decolonial post-colonial artworks. This by an artist born in Edinburgh, who was, a, as a child, he said, he was fascinated by the 1964 film Zulu. Um, and so what you see on the wall, the conventional work, the accessible, legible, intelligible work, is Edward Armitage's painting of 1858 titled Retribution, with the subtitle Britannia or Justice Impaling a Bengal ti uh, Tiger, emblematic of India. In front of which is Andrew Gilbert, born 1980, Edinburgh. Uh, a, the, okay, not the conga line, but it's, it's Andrew's death in Afghanistan, 1842, from 2010. Oh, I, my time is up. Okay. All right. All right. Here Gilbert is reinforcing the essentially tribal nature of regimental life with its formalized rituals and customs according to the catalog. It is an exorcism of Britain's imperial past. The figures appear, however, as if they are performing their masks as a parody of traditional African ceremonies and they seem to be dancing the conga, a Latin American dance of African origin. Armitage is telling tales from within empire. Tacked onto the end of the exhibition were a couple of galleries devoted to contemporary artists from some of the places impacted by British colonialism. Tacked on, tangential, ancillary. I first heard the term nature's nation in 1989 when I took a survey of US art with David C. Huntington and when landscape representation was largely interpreted according to the primacy of New England and the beauty of its conventions. With this exhibition in catalog, curator Carl Cusero directly challenged the old understanding of a nationalism loca localized to regional supremacy. The truly heroic efforts of Cusero and Alan Braddock must be acknowledged. The number, of, the number and diversity of scholars recruited to the project is a model for how to tackle a difficult subject. In their introduction, they explain the choice of Hegarty's Fallen Bierstadt. They write, Fallen Bierstadt is not meant as an act of violence against Yosemite per se, but rather an act of deliberate unraveling of landscape aesthetics that idealize nature as something pristine, transcendent, and untouchable. And yet, even in the face of Hegarty's blistering gesture, eco-critical art history encourages us to acknowledge the important role played by romantic painting in the hands of such artists as Moran and Bierstadt, who gave aesthetic sanction to the early American conservation movement. And this is where they reverse themselves, a movement unquestionably problematic in its alliance with the violent exclusionary forces of manifest destiny, but nonetheless influential in institutionalizing ideas about environmental protection. End of quote. And yet, we are bound and implicated by the questions we choose to answer. My question remains, what does it mean to celebrate histories of conservation and what Carl Jacobi described as the era of extermination? And you'll notice the description uh, further down the text, they're exploring environmentally informed ways of understanding art history, tracing how visions of the environment have changed from the native European encounter to the emergence of modern ecological activism. And I would add, and I would say, I would respond, whether it is the elevation of Standing Rock at the expense of Flint, or centering the only redemptory encounter that seems to matter to the eco-critical turn, Indigenous First Nations people and Europeans, we must resist. The inclusion of Jacob Lawrence is indeed important, but more 
can be said about the history of black people and the symbol and resource that landscape represents and represented to them. For example, on March 4th of this year, a couple of days ago, Fast Company reported uh, in an article called Beyond Black Wall Street, these experts are unearthing historically black towns lost to history. It's Simone Davis and Dr. Atia Martin who note that anywhere between 200 and 1,200 black towns existed or exist or existed and that they have been able to find records of more than 80 thus far. In Massachusetts, they said, we had a historically black town in Plymouth, which is where almost every elementary school kid goes to learn about Plymouth Rock and that no one mentions it was also home to a historic black town named New Guinea Settlement at Parting Ways in Plymouth. They were emancipated by the Massachusetts Constitution. The government deeded about 100 acres of land to them in exchange for their service in the Revolutionary War. The town was added to the National Registry of Historic Places in 1979. Southern Empire, in which is housed one of the most iconic images of 19th century Aman uh, American landscape representation is Asher B. Duran's progress. Museums like the Virginia Museum of Fine Art benefit from curators like Leo Mazow, who is willing to challenge the old narratives. He considers the hiring of the museum's first curator of Native American art, Dr. Joanna Minich, a positive move, and he shares his galleries with her and speaks enthusiastically about her ongoing intervention in the gallery of iconic U.S. landscape representation. But museums must walk a fine line with their audiences, and so we find soft, inoffensive language that reduces racialization, extermination, kidnapping, poisoning, rape, lynching, infanticide, murder, to the term trauma. Text and image battle in these contexts. An artistic convention will always win because it is the most legible and coherent within our epistemologies of looking versus reading versus abstraction. Installed across the room from Duran's progress, we must ask, is the work of indigenous artists answering the viciousness of empire, or is it a mirror that throws us back onto the beauty and convention of landscape? Enough about me, now you say something about me. <laughs> Intentional programming can animate the spaces in new ways. For, for example, Dr. Minich curates an annual Pocahontas reframed film festival. It's in its, it's, I think it's going into its sixth year. But I turn your attention to the wall label. Here, text and image merge. The text of the wall label and the text within the image. While the label must do the work of battling American land, American people. It is my contention that it is simply, that it simply is not up to the task because as you move around the galleries and those space, spaces dedicated to British colonial and US art, the uh, American galleries, it is back to business as usual. And so this gallery becomes like a spectacle, like the musical number that would suddenly erupt in the middle of a film after which the narrative would resume. In fact, a deep dive into cinematic studies may go towards solving the issues around redemptory installations. Indigenous artists and indigenous curators know this is not historical trauma. The damage is ongoing and exceeds any and all representational strategies. Lot 22, Northern Plains, Indian child's tunic, early 19th century, fringed and with beaded collar, showing signs of central bullet trauma to be sold in the decorative arts auction at Waddington's in Toronto. They were shamed, finally, into pulling uh, 
this tunic from the auction block, 2014. Colonizing, according to Timothy Mitchell, refers not simply to the establishing of a European presence, but also to the spread of a political order that inscribes in the social world a new conception of space, new forms of personhood, and a new means of manufacturing the experience of the real. And I would end, I would close by saying, we must be especially cautious around eco-criticism, lest it become an ideology that on the one hand wages its ongoing critique of capitalism and on the other reinvents an encounter that continues to entertain a cost-benefit analysis on the road to progress. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you to the organizers. Um, anyone who's tuning in online, or if there's any Native folks here, I'll just briefly introduce myself for my language. Um, so I am Navajo Dene from the Four Corners. Um, I'm currently finishing my postdoc and soon to be assistant professor of anthropology at the University of Chicago. Um, I don't teach about American art at all, <laughs> so I'll just preface that. However, I'm very interested in representations of landscape, which I'll be kind of uh, talking about today. And my broader research actually focuses on legacies of extraction, um, in particular, a uranium extraction in the Colorado Plateau and the Navajo Nation. Where's the click? Is this it? Oh, okay, this looks like a bomb detonator, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, well, in light of the theme of the symposium today, I want to share some emergent thoughts connecting settler colonial violence, painterly landscape traditions, and representations of toxic exposure in environmental photography through a larger analytic that I term the settler sublime. I tie together these disparate threads with iconic imagery of the American West as an ongoing fiction of settler desire and imagination. Um, I begin here with this excerpt from Frederick Jackson Turner and his off-sighted and now off-debunked frontier thesis. For brevity, I will not read. But here I draw attention to the material traces of the settler colonial frontier project. In my larger work, I analyze this in the dilapidated infrastructure of abandoned mines and railroad lines, or in the traces of iron-rich sulfides embedded in river settlement, whose toxic presence is reanimated re again with the stirring of a stick or tossing of a stone into a shallow bank. And in our bodies, the ultimate gauge and instrument are bodies that bear witness, but whose testimonies are too often readily dismissed. The magnitude of colonial violence is likewise framed as too grand to comprehend or even to acknowledge. And so too the settler sublime elevates that which it cannot grasp into a form of aesthetic desire and a justification for the destruction it created. And in this way, the frontier concept remains deeply entrenched in the American imagination where representations of the West from a Euro-American framework are remembered mostly with nostalgia rather than despair. Um, just really briefly, here's uh, three I iconic images by Thomas Moran. Many of you may already be familiar with these. Um, so nowhere is this imagery imaginary more potent than the portraiture tradition of the mid-19th century. Follow the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, the Western frontier was rendered available for ex exploration, extraction, and settlement. By the 1860s, Congress passed several pieces of legislation enabling the survey and construction of several transcontinental railroad lines. 
As iron infrastructure expedited settler access to territory, federal sponsored land survey expeditions proliferated with greater fervor as well. In March 1871, Congress appropriated $40,000 for, quote, continuing the geological survey of the territories of the United States by Professor Hayden under direction of the Secretary of Interior, end quote. Two months later, under the direction of Ferdinand Vanderveer Hayden, the nearly four month long survey began. Crucial to the implementation of the scientific expedition was the inclusion of image makers. These included visual artists of different mediums, including photography, painting, and cartography. Photographer William Henry Jackson and painter Thomas Moran were recruited to join the survey of the Yellowstone region in Northwestern Wyoming Territory. Um, I thought this was interesting to include because he did various versions of paintings. Um, and maybe this is something that many more of you could speak to, but um, I think this just points to the fact that these were largely um, idealizations um, or fantasies. Um, they weren't necessarily uh, meant to be, be accurate in their exactitude um, from a painterly perspective. Um, so this very much is part of the sublime fantasy. And this is a, a real photograph that I found um, online. <laughs> Trained in the so-called Hudson River School tradition in New York, Moran spent approximately 40 days in the Yellowstone region with the survey party. During his trip, he kept a diary and produced more than 30 sketches and watercolors of Yellowstone's cliffs. By uh, early August of 71, he departed and made his way back to Philadelphia to begin working on the portrait that would define his legacy as, quote, a painter of the American West. Um, by February of 1872, the House of Representatives voted um, in favor of setting the region aside as America's first national park. President Ulysses S. Grant signed the bill in, into law just two days later. The viewing of Moran's completed painting, The Grand Canyon of Yellowstone, as the myth goes, supposedly so moved lawmakers, and in particular President Grant himself, that they passed the law in record time. As many other critical scholars of Native American history have argued, the protection, conservation, and preservation of wilderness went hand in hand with the literal genocide and dispossession of indigenous peoples and their territories. Yellowstone, for instance, encompasses over 2.2 million acres. The ideological and artistic rendering of land emptied of indigenous habitation informed federal Indian policy making and the emergent conceptualizations of public land simultaneously. And in fact, if you Google US Department of Interior Museum, which I encourage you all to do, you will see um, the image, Moran's uh, Grand Canyon image proudly displayed on the front page. And if, does, uh, if this doesn't show you how integral these representations are still to current US policy and public lands development, then I don't know what is. Okay. This image here is one of several versions of a subject that the artist associated with his expeditions in the American West. On his journey to join Hayden's survey in 1871, the artist passed through the small town of Green River in what is currently known as Utah and made a drawing of the cliffs. Um, let's see. This example, like many others, illustrates how the goal of the artistic process itself was not to represent reality as such, but rather an impression of a place largely based on composites, memories, idealizations. The chasm of the Colorado was created following Moran's participation in John Wesley Powell's infamous survey of the Colorado River. Here I am drawn to these representations not only in its endurance in national narratives of American individualism, westward expansion, and discourses of man conquering nature, but also for how these narratives continue to inform ideas around natural resource development in the arid west. Um, and also just to kind of show the pervasiveness of this imagery, it's also on the, the front cover of John Wesley's Powell book. Okay. Well, now I'm going to shift gears and discuss some of my own photographic practice and reflections of the sublime. 
The fog moves through the valley slowly and deliberately as its velvet bellows fill in the contours of cragged rock and patches of vegetation. It begins to rain again as I quickly retrieve a plastic bag from my jacket pocket and secure it over my DSLR body and lens. I didn't expect the weather to be this cold on an early August morning. Then again, we were pushing 10,000 feet near the confluence of the North Folk and Cement Creek in the San Juan Mountains north of Silverton, Colorado. I, along with a couple dozen other scientists, journalists, and mining industry professionals were huddled together as a guide took us on a tour around the Gladstone Interim Water Treatment Plant established to mitigate, mitigate acid mine discharge from the Gold King Mine located directly upstream for where we stood. It was on this day, exactly one day prior, that occurred the largest regional mine spill in recent history. This was 2015. The now infamous Gold King mine spill galvanized a national debate about mining law reform and the role of over federal oversight in environmental remediation. At the center of these disputes, plastered across national media headlines, were images of iconic Rocky Mountain landscapes and yellow waterways, symbolic representations of the pure and the polluted. Some were obviously photoshopped to exaggerate the, the hue of the yellow disaster. Such imagery, digitally altered or not, were used to simultaneously advance arguments towards very different ends. Either the intentional failure of further government reg regulation or the necessity for greater federal involvement in the form of Superfund designation. The spill thus marked an imagined crossing of a threshold. However, the definition of this threshold readily shifted depending on who one asks and the relative hue of the yellow toxicant. Um, this image here was following a so-called super fund run, um, <laughs> where uh, I don't know if any of you participated in these races where they spray yellow powder. Um, so this was like invoking the literal color of the spill that had happened one year prior, um, not in the best form. Um, my larger work also tra um, traces the path of the spill into Diné communities. Um, so they're uh, downstream communities from Silverton, Colorado. Um, and yellow invokes um, a much more insidious um, legacy of uranium mining um, dating from the Cold War era. Um, so this, this yellow ha has taken on many different meanings. Um, and for this reason, this entire photo essay series is called Tokletso, which literally means yellow water in the Diné language. Um, an iconic uh, Tommy Knocker figure. Days later, as I reviewed hundreds, photo hundreds of photographs from the trip, I found myself drawn to this image, um, not only for the composition itself, but the colors. Dare I say that the image appeared beautiful. In the image, the water appears to emanate from an unseen source. Rubble from prior mining operations lay haphazardly on the slope. The colors of both soil and water are alluring in their otherworldly presentation. This was not the sort of beauty that brought pleasure, but rather the image increasingly stirred in me an unsettled feeling marked by discomfort and disgust. I had experienced this sort of mixed pleasure and, uh, and unease viewing other photos of toxic contamination, those by uh, a well-known environmental photographer, Edward Vertinsky. In her analysis of manufactured landscapes, a 25-year retrospective of landscape photography by Vertinsky, Jennifer Peoples, quote, reconceptualizes the sublime response to contaminated places to chart how such photographs function in environmental communication, end quote. Peoples references a quote um, by Susan Sontag on how photographs have a determining influence in shaping what catastrophes and crises we pay attention to. The scale and magnitude of Bertinsky's images often taken from such heightened perspective that the landscape becomes no longer recognizable as such, which has the potential to naturalize or even exalt the activities of environmental extraction and destruction. Even as Bertinsky reveals in his imagery the aftermath of so-called human progress, the symbolic representation of landscape collapses the beautiful and, and sublime into a form of memorialization where it is not clear for whom or for what we, the viewer, is mourning. 
the photograph thus becomes a monument to the very extractive processes that Bertinsky supposedly chooses to document in order to spurn public action. This sort of practice of documentation to raise awareness has often been a comfortable rationale for environmental activists and anthropologists who act with the justification that if the public only knew, would certain environmental violence be diminished or halted? The belief that such imagery might compel action is rooted with underlying understandings of what effective power lies in the object's apprehension. In the phenomenological aesthetic tradition, the concept of beauty has an incomprehensible counterpart, the sublime. Kant describes beauty in terms of pleasure, though not necessarily desire, and that such judgments of beauty may be universally accepted as such. Defines the sublime as limitless so that the mind in the presence of the sublime, attempting to imagine what it cannot, has pain in the failure, but pleasure in contemplating the immensity of the attempt. There is immense feeling in the sublime apprehension, a desire for grasping what cannot be fully comprehended. For Edmund Burke, the sublime is born from feelings of terror for, quote, it is productive of the strongest emotion which the mind is capable of feeling, end quote. Therefore, the sublime is a state of desire created by the European male subject's inability to fathom the magnitude, scale, and power of a given object. I argue that the inability to comprehend the scale and magnitude of toxic exposure is likewise reflected in the inability for the settler subject to acknowledge the continued manifestation of colonial violence on our lands, territories, and bodies. Instead, there is a desire and pleasure in the domination of the once insurmountable. In the misapprehension of this violence, our consequent suffering becomes marked as beautiful or resilient. The scale of colonial violence and pain is thus incomprehensible. The representation of such sanitized violence in depictions of landscape is what we might call a settler sublime. I'm almost done, one more paragraph. Oh. Thus, the settler sublime describes not merely an effective state in the apprehension of a toxic aesthetic, but rather, and more pointedly, the inability to comprehend both the magnitude of colonial violence and the pernicious after effects of toxic exposure produced in its wake. It is both eventful and eventless. In this way, I also wonder how this desire to literally bring into focus the monumental mimics the normative denial or other habitual forms of violence. Toxicity, like colonial violence, pervades in all forms and scales. This tendency to focus on discrete discharges and high impact spill events obscures what Patrick Wolf theorizes as the enduring structure of settler colonialism. In this vein, Métis scholar Zoe Todd reminds us to pay careful attention to quote, how settler colonial states conceive of, relate to, and lay claim to land and water, and how such insights are crucial in providing us with the conceptual and practical tools to refuse and refract the state's understandings of its own doctrines and destinies, end quote. Um, so as this brief survey of a particular tradition of American art has shown us, narratives of expanding frontiers and the settler sublime in landscape representations inform and are informed by broader settler colonial federal Indian policy making, both historically and into the present. As you're walking up, I have all these images that I'm not gonna be able to show, but this are, these are, um, I can talk to this later, these are images from the, um, the yellow water exhibit that my pieces were in. So if, if someone wants to ask about that, I'm happy to answer questions later. Okay, thank you. Hi everyone, thank you for being here all the way through to the end of the day. 
Dear us, the plural pronoun here signifies the same us summoned by Toni Morrison when she wrote, quote, I think about us black women a lot, <clears throat> end quote. In her 1985 love letter, A Knowing So Deep for Essence Magazine. <clears throat> How might black feminist art history nourish the idea of togetherness and its radical possibilities? <clears throat> This question evokes what post-colonial scholar Gayatri Spivak calls a, quote, um, strategic essentialism. While we are a fabulously diverse bunch, I believe in a collective we when it comes to black women and our fraught navigations of the, no <coughs> of the notion of home, or what I call in this presentation black feminist domesticity which includes a range of black women's political and aesthetic concerns related to homemaking and kinship. <clears throat> I am a black queer feminist and an emerging historian of African and African diaspora art, and I desire a dislodging of the field's hierarchies and borders. There are two assumptions that I'll hold true today. <clears throat> One is, Pulling from the Combahee River Collective's 1977 Black Lesbian Feminist Manifesto, if black women were free, <clears throat> it would mean that everyone else would have to be free since our freedom would necessitate the destruction of all the systems of oppression. Two, while we should abolish the notion that one person could possibly study and teach all of black and African art and culture throughout history, I am weary of academic and curatorial discourse that seeks to separate the study of African art history from the diaspora. A black Atlantic lens can reckon with the historic specificity <coughs> of different communities while also emphasizing the global condition of anti-blackness, that anti-blackness which produces <coughs> similar conditions in traditions throughout the globe. My offering today is the notion that black women's art making practices within and concerning the home, or again, the visual culture of black feminist domesticity are essential to the history of American art. I propose that three intimate gestures, braiding, weaving, and sweeping, describe the formal strategies of black women artists and present a method <coughs> of engagement within these art histories. J.D. Ojikere was a Nigerian photographer known for documenting the ethereal braided hairstyles of women of African descent. <clears throat> this is Abebe 1975 from the Hood Collection. Quote, in any black neighborhood, you, can, you cannot escape noticing the presence of so many barber shops and hairdressing salons. So many hair care products and so much advertising to help sell them all and among young people especially, so much skill and sheer fastidiousness that goes into the styles you can see on the street." End quote. Writes art historian Cabana Mercer in his 1987 essay, Black Hairstyle Politics. He continues, black hairstyling may thus be evaluated as a popular art form, articulating a variety of aesthetic solutions to a range of problems created by <clears throat> ideologies of race and racism. Those problems, again, being the equation of blackness with ugliness, especially black hair, black skin, et cetera. <clears throat> Whether inside the home or in a salon, the space of braiding hair is often communal, serving as a space for women to discuss and theorize their lives, or what bell hooks identifies as women making feminist transformation possible through a theory that emerges from the concrete, um, which is the same as what Patricia Hill Collins calls a black woman's standpoint um, that she articulates as black feminist thought. <clears throat> and there is a 16th century legend of a West Central African king who was formerly enslaved by the Portuguese, Bencos Biojo, and successfully escaped to Colombia after enslaved women mapped escape routes and braided them into their hair to guide him. Braiding hair is an aesthetic and fugitive practice. 
Moving towards weaving, these are two indigo textiles from the Hoods African Art Collection. A Yoruba artist wrapper to be worn by a woman around her waist from 1977, and an Adira quilt by Nike Davis Okundaye from 2002. The materiality of indigo, as well as the process of weaving and quilting, connects West African and African American women. Um, <clears throat> Adire is an indigo dyed cloth that comes from Yoruba women in Southwest Nigeria who use a different range of resist dye techniques like tying, stitching, and folding the fabric while applying color to it, um, either from natural indigo or commercialized blue dye. <clears throat> By the early 20th century, Yoruba women artists who use this technique were able to sell their adire cloth to support their economic livelihood. And Nike Kondaye is likely the most well-known Nigerian artist trained in the indigo adire cloth tradition. <clears throat> okay. Since the transatlantic slave trade, African women brought their textile traditions with them to the Americas. The G's Bend quilters in Alabama have been quilting for centuries and the techniques have been passed down through generations. A number of the women still live directly on the land where their ancestors were enslaved. Some describe their creative process as God-given, while others describe it as a meditative process in which women can simply commune and quilt together. Emily Petwise, um, Campbell's Blocks and Strips work clothes quilt from the 1950s um, in the Met Collection is one of many G's Bend quilts that carries forth this carries forth this formal theme of indigo. G's Bend quilters are masterful bricolores and often use scraps of different fabrics to make their vibrant creations. Petway's quilt <clears throat> above uses scraps of denim a symbol of the working class farmers and sharecropper, sharecroppers who wear denim. By the civil rights and black power era, black activists throughout the country began wearing blue jeans for symbolic reasons. As denim became a pro-working class solidarity sartorial choice. <clears throat> Besides Petway's quilt is Basha Chakrabarti's It's a Blue World from 2021. Chakrabarti, Oops, sorry, I lost my place. Chakrabarti was drawn to G's Ben Quilters, um, whose work reminded her of textiles she had seen in India, and she's a South Asian, women, South Asian woman. Um, she, during a year on leave from her MFA program during COVID, um, she drove from New Haven to Alabama and communed with G's Ben Quilters. Um, not a residency, but she basically just drove there and she helped them use social media to sell quilts and they taught her how to quilt. <coughs> Chakrabarti dances with indigo and divulges its secrets. We are all touched by the color as it proliferates the interstices of South by South ecologies meaning U.S. South, Global South. <clears throat> While its etymology identifies indigo as a product of India, the history of the blue dye is globalized. Major 18th century indigo plantations were found in India and the New World. Um, sorry, India and the American South, forging a commercial entanglement between the so-called Old World and New World. Um, which orchestrated um, the profit for the colonial metropole in Europe. Chakrabarti represents these overlapping imperial cartographies in It's a Blue World by, <clears throat> by threading ancient and colonial era indigo trade routes on a global map. Crafting these works with indigo sourced from around the globe on quilted fabric Chakrabarti traces the transnational history of this blue pigment and dye while simultaneously affirming that map making and quilt making are world making endeavors. Um, and this is to clarify the same work. <clears throat> it's just the front and back of it and it's hung in the gallery. 
it's quite large. <coughs> Often American art historians evoke the Jeans Ben quilters to illustrate that African American women have a stake in the origin tales of modernist abstraction. As opposed to comparing Jeans Ben quilts solely to Pierre Mondrian or Paul Clay, um, affirming their artistry by formal comparison to white men abstractionists, um, might we instead move towards this type of intergenerational and women of color feminist approach? Okay, I'll spend le much less time on this section, but I'm becoming more and more intrigued by basketry within the realm of metaphorical and formal weaving. Um, another in the Hood collection, this work is identified as a Yoruba American power basket from the 20th century, made from iron, horn, bone, fur, shell, hide, and wood and string. This is an example of black diasporic sacred medicine that combines West African ancestral material culture with the materials found in the Americas. Um, I'm currently in the process of researching this object, but I included it because it's a really like prime example of how black diasporic um, medicine will make use of materials found in the Americas. Um, so when dislocated from, the ho from one's homeland, they make do with what the Americas has ecologically. And, <coughs> okay. These are two baskets from the Smithsonian collection, one in the African American History and Culture Museum and the other in the National Museum of African Art. And basketry, like textile arts, is a way that black women artists in West, in West Africa and in the US South can express themselves, commune and work together, meditate and become entrepreneurs through the making of artworks that also function as objects for everyday use. Okay, so sweeping. Culturally and politically, the symbol of the broom is abundant through global African cultures. Um, what we see on the screen is a broom that was used by historically black church to clean up in Baltimore after the protests, um, after, after the police killing of Freddie Gray. I'd argue that perhaps this odd choice of acquiring a broom is linked to the significance of brooms in black cultures. Um, and I'm gonna list out a few of those associations. The grassroots movement called Citizens Broom um, was responsible for the 2014 Burkinabe uprising in Burkina Faso. Um Chayelo, um, Zulu grass brooms made by black South African women in the Eastern Cape um, are used for cleaning and driving away evil spirits. Nigerians wave traditional brooms during political elections. And of course, African Americans jump the broom at weddings. Brooms have everyday use in African life worlds as objects creatively made and designed, as well as tools used for spiritual cleanses and physical cleaning of the home. Whether it is in apartheid South Africa or within the long history of US racism, black women have historically worked as domestic laborers in white households. The broom thus might symbolize the maintenance work that black women do and which makes domestic labor a central organizing principle in black feminist movements. In, this is my teacher's pet moment, in White Women Listen, Black Feminism and the Boundaries of Sisterhood, Hazel Carby argues that, <laughs> quote, Ide ideologies of black female domesticity and motherhood have been constructed through their employment or, chat or chattel position as domestics and surrogate mothers to ha for white families um, rather than in relation to their own families, end quote. Domesticity is fraught for black women. However, we know that the domestic sphere and the care work, perfor and the care work performed there can be a source of resistance. And Angela Davis taught us that, taught us this in <clears throat> her essay, The Role of the Black Woman in the Community of Slaves from 1971. <clears throat> Further 
attention to transnational practices of black women weaving, sweeping, and braiding can help us understand the art, resistance, and homemaking of black women often overlooked in our historical genealogies that ignore the everyday. <clears throat> Whether it is baskets, brooms, quilts, or hairstyles, the visual culture of black feminist domesticity teaches us about the relationship between African and African diaspora art forms, as well as black women's tendency towards bricolage. One minute. Okay, <laughs> one last paragraph. Braiding, weave, braiding, sweeping, weaving, understanding these gestures as connected to the domestic sphere, but also as metaphorically rich. Braiding and weaving, the action of entangling different forms in an intentional design. If we are to take this seriously as a mode of study and creative production, um, it should encourage us to focus on the interconnectedness, solidarities, frictions, and entanglements in American art history. <clears throat> Whether it is a topic like cross-cultural quilting um, or black and native women's artistry <clears throat> with baskets using sweetgrass, for example, away from the hyper-individualism of the neoliberal academy and the borders it proliferates, we can push for braiding and weaving intimacies across different groups. Sweeping, associated with sweeping away evil spirits and Afro-Atlantic religions, and tending towards, um, and tending to the home by cleaning, has a metaphorical purpose too that can become method. Much of this research requires broad sweeps across different time periods <laughs> and geographies, as opposed to distinct periodization, which is intellectually demanding, but possible to do if one builds a home in more than one discipline. Um, if it is true, as, as Audre Lorde believed, that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house, then we must build and keep our own home. Thank you. Well, it's very exciting to have all the people up here with us for our conversation. As we get settled, I was wondering if, Mila, if you had any opening thoughts for us or questions. I thought Mila brought us up my um, microphone. Is this better? <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, a whole day's worth of, of questions. <laughs> I mean, we've moved from sort of reframing to redefining, um, sorry, moved from complicating through reframing and uh, to redefining. And at each point, it seems to me, we've been questioning, um, you know, language, uh, interrogating what does America mean, actually? Um, should it be America's? Um, is it really the, the dominance of the, of the US? Is it another, an, another form of uh, imperialist? domination to actually use the term. Um, but I'm also really interested in this particular panel too. Um, on all of the above, what are the practices of redefining um, of what America means, but also the question of the disciplines and, and disciplinarity. And it seems to me that one of the sort of um, apparently uh, successful practices um, currently wielded by um, administrators happen under the banner of diversity, belonging, and inclusion. Uh, and I would suggest that those terms, diversity, belonging, and inclusion, are actually the sort of contemporary articulation of tactics of colonial and imperial pacification. That what we're actually meant to, to do is to you know, settle for 
uh, used to be called multiculturalism, um, but it's forms of thinking where you know you're you're putting various say artworks or something ad adjacent to each other, but not actually deliberately not causing a form of blindness about what it would really mean to decolonize, to de-imperialize, to actually be asking, and I think this phrase came up before, what it would really take for another world to be possible. It's not a settlement with this world. And diversity, belonging, and inclusion is asking for a settlement with colonization. When you enter the first gallery of the This Land exhibition, it's clear that you are entering a struggle over all those terms, a struggle for control of land. Colonization is about the colonization of people, of land, and of all things living on it, and we are still living with that violence. And so I would actually argue that diversity, belonging, and inclusion are precisely about maintaining that violence. This is what colonial pacification um, does. So I would ask sort of, you know, our, our panelists, and I've just, I think these are absolutely just brilliant um, papers. The entire day has been really incredibly thought provoking. But I would ask each of you if you think that our building, I'm one of the people who've done it, the building of these disciplinary entities, actually what we have built are siloed fields where we've spent perhaps more time um, urging that we have respectable disciplinary recognition than we actually have spent on being insurgent about overturning those forms of knowledge, about overturning the way in which these colonial forms of knowledge are perpetuated by our institutions. So I think I'd love to hear your thoughts about our existences within these disciplinary boundaries. Okay, so Everyone hear me? Okay, so for me, something I've been really wanting to say about this topic and about interdisciplinarity is that, and this is coming from somebody who has been trained interdisciplinarily from the beginning because I'm in black studies and gender studies, um, but I think there's also a romance or a fetishization of interdisciplinarity. And whenever I talk about the benefits of it, I feel like I have to bring this up because like since the Cold War era, we know that there was movements to see if art could hold information for like military technology. And there was a development of like the Art and Technology Institute, I think at Stanford. And there were, there was a sense of like, how can art and science come together, for example? to like bolster creativity in the military or even today um, the digital humanities funded projects sometimes use the same databases that are used by police stations so i'm skeptical of interdisciplinarity because for example at yale sometimes we'll have people from the military come take middle eastern studies art classes for example and it's often with a kind of neo-colonial mission attached to it. So that I am skeptical of. At the same time, I think that if you decolonize the academy, um, these separations of like literature and vision and even sensations like smell versus seeing versus hearing, that's all a Western concept because like what I know from my studies of historical African art is that there's not really a separation between music and text and dance and it's all embedded and there's no need to kind of specialize and periodize in the way that we see it in the Western Academy. The 
this working now? Okay. Um, well, since I'm trained in social science, um, you know, I learned ethnography and participant observation as my methodology, right? And of course, anthropology um, has a very extractive legacy um, in indigenous communities, most especially um, on the Navajo Nation. Um, you know, there's that joke that every Navajo family had an anthropologist in it. Um, almost true. Um, so, you know, I actually have a very fraught relationship with this discipline. I didn't study it in undergrad. Um, my initial interest, actually, when I went to grad school was to become a curator. Um, so I, I've had interest in using education and curation for some time, but it, was, it wasn't until that I went and got my PhD at NYU um, that I became really interested in the application of, of this knowledge of, like, if I'm going to be in this colonial discipline, there's a way that I can also push back. And I know that's going against a little bit with like the odd for Lord quote. Um, but using um, these methodologies to train other students, and I'm currently at an institution where I'm the only currently like tenure track uh, Native faculty is working on Native issues. So, um, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of issues with that, but also it makes me excited when I see in my classroom like all the students of color uh, rush to take my classes um, so I can like provide some sort of support system for them um, in an otherwise still quite white elite institution. Um, and also part of you know going back home and doing you know field work and why I I'm compelled to actually do this research on you know, the legacies of environmental contamination was precisely because when I went home, there was um, a notification of uranium contamination um, in the community, and my family members knowing that I knew like research asked me for help. And so I, I shifted all of my interests around issues of jurisdiction and sovereignty um, to actually trying to address this water crisis. So. Um, yeah, a lot of my broader work is still around, you know, the, these these legacies of um, uh, of, of settlement, of, of extraction in all forms, either in academia and, and also like materially through mining, um, but then also in ways that I can then retranslate that um, into my pedagogy and also doing these uh, like art museum practices. Um, and also expanding, working interdisciplinarily. So I'm working a lot with, um, you know, in cultural geography now and also public health because I feel like those disciplines can actually address these things on the ground. So I've actually become much more interdisciplinary as I've gone, al gone along, even though I started very squarely in one discipline. So over the course of, um, I took my first art history class in 1982. And over the course of the decades, I have learned that you don't have to love the discipline that you are in. That, in fact, you are disciplined by the discipline, meaning you are spanked, you are beaten, you are <laughs> humiliated, you are degraded. Sometimes you are uplifted, but it behooves you to know that discipline inside and out. It behooves you to know it so that you know what you are fighting. And you know, one of the things my mother taught me is to relish the fight. You don't ever back down. You, you know, time to rest when you're done. I'm not done. And so in terms of, um, you know, and I completely agree with you about DEIB. And the irony is I'm, I've been named the inaugural chair of Africana Studies, right? And so, um, I, and I'm using the position to fix what's broken across campus. All of the faculty who have been betrayed, who have been abused, they have a home now. They have a, a tenure-granting home. And so my mother was also a secretary, and she taught me that you can beat the system from within and that you have a right to feed yourself and clothe yourself. In terms of the Audre Lorde quote, I, I give it to every student I encounter. The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. She actually tells you what the master's tools are. And I, it's the most misunderstood four pages of a speech I've ever encountered. The master's tools is distraction. 
It is, it is the work that you have to do to educate people who should already effing know better, right? And so the master's tools is distraction. And doing other people's work means you can't dismantle the master's house. And DEIB <laughs> is exactly that. So questions from the audience? I think there are people both sides with um, microphones ready for you to take your questions. Hello. Thank you so much for your presentations. My question is for Alexandra. You start out your talk riveting, by the way, um, by saying you just didn't see it like a separation or there didn't need to be a separation between African art practices and the study of that. And then the, the black diaspora totes agree. But there's that little difficulty with hiring and having people occupy three spaces. So every, I know three black art historians, every black art historian I know is doing Africa and the diaspora, and that is impossible. So I wanna know what you think the solution to that might be, because I, I agree with you that it's all there, but then you get into the bureaucracy and the logistics of lines, hires, extra work for people who are already overworked. Yeah, that's a great question. I think about this all the time, honestly. Um, I think the issue with the separation of the departments, too, is less that they always belong together, but that they have different genealogies. So African studies is often like from that push for area studies, which has a lot to do with neocolonialism and sustainable development and NGOization of the continent. Um, that's like the area studies Cold War formation. And then black studies slash African American studies is like the 1968, 1969 revolutions on college campuses. So I find that sometimes when they're separate, the departments, like an African studies department will be like all white and maybe like one black person. Um, so I want them, I think universities where they're together, th African studies then, isn't so bound by like sustainable development and neocolonialism, like you're able to do more with it. But for art history specifically, and for like hiring of people who teach Africa in the diaspora, I feel like they just need to hire more people. They just need to hire more people, honestly. Um, when I came to Yale, I thought I was the coolest thing in the world because we had two black professors working on black art and art history. Like, and I told everybody, apply to this program at Yale. We've got two black professors. <laughs> and like, the fact that that's the case, like, you can have like seven different people who have a range of topics ranging between Africa and the diaspora, but like, they don't have to teach at all. They can be more specialized. So, that's my solution. if nobody else has one. I don't want to hog the stage there. Okay, so how difficult is it in terms of the sort of questions of how language has divided up colonial histories? So no land dispossession. Okay, great. You know, that's First Nations people. Slavery, okay, well, we know who in is in that slot. That's the origin of, you know, black exploitation. How have the very languages we used made it actually difficult for us to cross those boundaries and think about what I think is actually extremely necessary, um, indigenous 
and, Af and indigenous peoples and African descended peoples together uh, under the question of colonial exploitation and settler colonialism. It's just an easy question. <laughs> We've made land stand in as proxies for identity and land becomes identity object um, focused. So only Africans inhabit plantations, Africans and their white masters when there were black slave owners. Uh, on, only, and, and so, and, and this is what I always tell my students, make language dynamic. So you don't talk about race, but what you do talk about is how racism maintains, constructs and maintains race, right? It's the ideology that constructs and maintains the, the condition of identity. It's nationalism that constructs and maintains nation. It is sexism that constructs and maintains gender. And don't talk about identity without translating or don't read it without translating in your head identification. I have a cousin who is African American, born and raised on the south side of Chicago, who became a police officer, who voted for Bush. It's identification. Right? He identifies with a certain articulation of power. And so in order to understand him, I had to understand identification. And, and the other thing is, whenever you read the other, reject it as a noun, it is a verb, to other. Right? And so you, you then have the, the consciousness to investigate the process of othering. So language is, is extremely important in every class that I teach and every student that I encounter. I try and inculcate them with uh, ways to make and to keep language active and to not rest on the abstractions like race, like gender, like nation, as if they were the real. I'll just briefly add, like pedagogically, when we talk about, you know, settler colonialism or racial capitalism, these are, these are all um, about relationships, right? So um, I always try to tell my students, you know, to think about how they exist in relation to, you know, land and to labor. And so if we think all of, if everything is kind of en encapsulated within relationships, then I think that's a way that you can bring together these seemingly disparate histories, right? Um, I do think that there's importance in maintaining, you know, um, the particular like violence and history of, of slavery um, that's distinct, you know, from land disposition of um, um, indigenous peoples of the Americas. However, these these are intertwined processes, um, so you have to be specific about how you're relating that process. Can I, yeah, can I add just one thing to that? I teach a course on American landscapes, and in order to recover the violence waged against early First Nations people, we have to look at John T. Coleman's book, Vicious, about how the English brought over their superstitions around wolves and their elaborate descriptions of decapitating them, humiliating them, making them bow down, and then how they would easily s slip into analogizing First Nations people with wolves. And you realize that these practices aren't discrete. So there, there are ways to kind of figure out and recover those early violences that don't get, um, you know, in, don't appear in lynching photos. I know we're at time, but really quickly, I think another thing with this is that there's like two major binaries I feel like we need to start undoing more in the field. One is that like for black people in the black Atlantic, that's like the OG thing. And then indigenous people, they're all about land. And kind of crossing those more and also seeing that blackness um, is 
almost always already indigenous. In that, I mean that as like a black American person, I don't consider myself a settler and very few people probably would call me a settler, but I do see my ancestral lineage as displaced indigenous people from West Africa. And indigenous people within the US can be in diaspora, can be in, di in forced dispersal. Whether you're adopted out of your tribe or you have to leave for whatever reason, that itself is a scattering of people. So it's not black people, water, indigenous people, land, diaspora, indigenous. They're actually all bundled up in one. Thank you, John. I think we're turning over to you. Is that correct now? Um, thank you to everybody who came here today. The ideas were flowing, uh, the challenges were paramount, and I think everybody in the field uh, feels that our work is still very much cut out for us. But I also feel that we have a generation that's shifting into the, the field that is really brilliant and has great ideas. And to be a little autobiogra autobiographical, I'm, I'm ready to kind of um, relinquish and make it possible for all of this generation to kind of come in and, 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 and do their work. And it's time for us to, to make room for this. And I was supremely heartened to hear how thoughtful all of these papers were today. Um, every step of the way, I felt engaged, challenged, and I hope all of you were too. Um, this will carry on. We saw this um, convening as a kind of an opening of a dialogue, uh, and we have hopefully spread our um, friendship network uh, further abroad than we had in the past. And I hope that all of you uh, continue to work with us and help us uh, try and put art into a context where it is meaningful, where we can think about uh, a two-way flow or even a circular flow of input and information with the world rather than uh, a museum sort of postulating and sharing uh, outward, you know, like we, we really want to become much more humble in the way we approach all of the works in our care. And finally, I just wanted to say that, you know, we've had, we have over 65,000 objects in the Hood Museum collection that we've counted. There's probably another 20,000 that we're getting to. Um, things, this all started almost 250 50 years ago with a woolly mammoth tooth uh, that we still have, uh, the woolly mammoth tooth. That was the first thing to come in. So part of our dilemma is what do you do with this incredible hodgepodge of items that were at some point considered absolutely essential to the education of young people in the United States? And I look to all of you for help um, in, in answering these things and the idea that Maybe there's some things we, we don't have a responsibility or a right or the capability to put on view. Uh, was quite liberating, actually, because sometimes the, the weight of this accumulation that surrounds us every day uh, is really quite more than we can bear. And um, we don't always know uh, how to take the next steps. Um, but I do think uh, that the team that did this land has done a really incredible job and I think it's fitting to wind up the day with another round of applause for that team who's brought us so far at the hood. And to all of our presenters today, thank you. It was really astounding. And with that, I have the joy of saying, let there be wine. <laughs> <laughs>